into the great space. Um, yeah, so thank you everybody for coming. Um, yeah, today the title of our seminar is How Did White People Become White? Um, I think everybody knows us here, but if not, I'm Lisa, mixed race, white English, black Zambian, grew up in a white majority area in the English countryside. Yep, and my name is Isolt, I'm um, French and Irish, and I'm white, and so that's the perspective that I'll be speaking from today. As yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just gonna like get right into it um one second okay so i'm just gonna get right into it um so basically the usage of white to classify people only dates back to the 16th century however at that time it still wasn't used in the same way as it is today and it wasn't used very frequently either so often other labels were used, for example, like um, in relation to religion, in relation to nationality, in relation to social class. Um, but over the last like four to five centuries, the meaning of whiteness has changed to include groups that were previously excluded. Um, and so in this seminar, we will, we will discuss the evolution of the term whiteness or white in order to answer the question, as I said, how did white people become white? So in our first seminar, we discussed the formation of white racial identities as a justification of slavery. Um, and just to reiterate, um, white racial identities are a construction of modernity. They were formed in order to subjugate black people, in order to defend this brutal oppression by making pseudo arguments um, as to why enslaved Africans were inferior especially because this was at the time of like the enlightenment and at the time of the age of reason which was a european movement which emphasized the rights of man and um, emphasized you know liberty and reason and put you know rational thinking at the forefront and because we were in you know this was the age and um, similarly a rational or pseudo rational argument was therefore needed to explain why africans were in bondage and so this is where pseudoscience came into play and also um, kind of like biblical justification just a little bit prior to that. And so these are both things that me and Esau talk about in the first seminar. So as I said, I'm not really going to go into it because if you want to watch that, um, which I recommend, and um, that's on our YouTube channel. Um, but I'll just give a brief overview. Um, well, I'll, I'll mention that um, the biblical justification was through like a, a Bible story called the Curse of Canaan um, and pseudoscience I guess was like faulty um, science that was used um, to kind of separate different races into um, like a racial hierarchy but as I said if you want to read or if you want to hear about that please go to our first seminar however in this seminar, we will mostly be focusing inwards on whiteness to understand where and when the boundaries of white change. And um, so, as I said, <laughs> so as I said, white racial identities were created during slavery and colonialism through biblical and pseudoscientific scientific justification. However, before this, white as an identity was entangled in pre-modern discourse of religious purity and of high social order and um, for example in Britain um, and so the religious structure excluded people who did not fit into the mold of spiritual purity this distinction was carried through to the, to the new world so through to the Americas um, and this I will talk about a little more in this in a second but um, secondly as I noted um, people also kind of white as a discourse was also used somewhat in the relation um, of or relation to high social status and um, so it relates to the idea that the aristocracy led a leisurely and sheltered life um, both literally and metaphorically and um, therefore they possessed pale skin because they were indoors a lot um, whereas the lower orders worked outside where the sun would hit them and you know, they made due to manual labor the manual labor that they were doing 
Um, and so an example of this attitude, attitude being played out, and um, we can see through the expression blue blood. Um, so this expression blue blood derives from the myth that aristocrats um, had um, skin so white and so transparent that their blood could be seen. And so these attitudes embedded, um, you know, it, they leaked through the social, the social, economic, um, cultural um, kind of structures of society to, to cement the superiority of the arist aristocracy. And so although these notions of white were somewhat in play to distinguish um, religious versus heathen and to distinguish like upper orders versus lower orders, they were not thought of in a racial context, context until slavery and colonialism. So that's why I say, you know, whiteness as a racial identity was actively created through, you know, modernity, through the new world, through these um, institutions of oppression and institutions of capitalist um, oppression. And so it's interesting to note that even at the beginning of slavery, um, so the beginning of modernity, the religious label was often used to distinguish between enslaved Africans and Europeans. Um, so in his book, Whiteness, an Introduction, Steve Garner writes that Christian and heathen in the American colonies rendered color distinct distinctions redundant until slaves began to convert to Christianity. So he also notes that during the slave revolt um, in Berbis, which is Dutch Guiana um, in South America um, in 1764, that the dead were not divided up into black and white or neither um, slave and free, but as Christians and heathens. So here, you know, we can still see this Christian heathen distinction playing out. And as I say, more so, even though the term white was you know, created, I guess, around the 16th century to describe people, as I said, it wasn't really used that frequently and it wasn't used as we know it today. And I also just want to make a note that the, the distinctions of free and unfree were also very um, airy because at this time, like, um, they did not correspond to um, either like African or European peoples. Like, it wasn't clear cut because um, there was a presence of European indentured servants. Therefore, like, using free and unfree was a bit of a confusing um, dichotomy, which Esau will talk about now. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. So now I'm going to. Um, try to give a bit of an overview of the status of indentured servants because it's quite relevant to understand um, the difference in treatment between basically white and black people but I'm going to show how it's kind of a little bit complex but basically if you don't know the definition of indentured servitude is um, it's basically these contracts that were given to people um, often in exchange for the trip from Europe to the United States um, for people who could not afford them. So it was basically five to seven year contracts where you'd work on a plantation or in a factory, but you wouldn't get paid, but you'd get, um, you wouldn't get paid, but in exchange you'd get the trip from Europe to um, the new world. And sometimes indentured servants wouldn't be people who wanted to migrate but they would be um political prisoners and this dates as early like this goes back to the 1600s so for example oliver cromwell so he's a bit of an ancient one um, um oliver cromwell sent many prisoners from the english civil wars to the caribbean so you know the, the the presence of indentured servants in the caribbean is quite um you know it goes back quite far um and so I just want to give you an inexhaustive list or like a non-exhaustive list of like the specificities of the indentured servants contract. So some contracts um, stated that you that they would provide a return home um, once your contract ended. So maybe, for example, in the case of prisoners and things like that. But obviously this was not very well regulated, so it um, wasn't guaranteed. Um, and there are many reports of female indentured servants being sexually abused and or raped by their um, employers. 
And um, there are also reports that if they fell pregnant, uh, their contract would actually be extended by two years. Um, so obviously, there, you know, the situation of indentured servant, indentured servants was a precarious one. However, um, as opposed to slavery, um, if you were uh, you were not paid, but you you were paying the price of your voyage, if that makes sense, in the cases of those who are migrants. Um, but you do have a contract which will expire generally in five to seven years. So the work that you're doing is going to come to an end. Your children are not going to be born into the status of indentured servants. Um, and once your contract expires, you will be free and you will have access to social mobility. I'm mentioning all of these things because and not only will you have access to social mobility, but you will sometimes you know, that there are, there are many indentured servants who went from that status to actually, they ended up ensl owning enslaved people. So I'm just, I'm stating these facts because I kind of want to put the em an emphasis on the difference in um, status of indentured servants and enslaved people. And just to give you an idea, between the uh, 1630 and 1770, almost one half of the immigrants of the european immigrants who came to the america to the 13 american colonies at the time so the united states basically um almost half of those immigrants were indentured servants so just just gives you a magnitude of um you know this trend um and so also it's worth mentioning that there are multiple forms of servitude and multiple um different kind of trends of indentured servitude uh, notably the indian servitude in the caribbean um which due to lack of time of space uh, time and space i'm not really going to cover that but i invite you to uh, look into it um and finally i just want to end by saying that of course you know, indentured servitude has been banned in most countries, and it has been condemned by the human, the UN human civil, um, the UN civil, the UN Human Rights Watch. Um, it has been condemned as a form of slavery, but I do want to make it very, very clear that though um, the indentured servants were working alongside slaves on plantations, for example, and though the treatment by the masters or the employers or whatever you want to call them. Um, was clearly bad and their situation was clearly precarious, I really want you to kind of um, remember that there were very stark differences in the legal statuses of indentured servants and enslaved people. And I'm going to explain why I'm putting such an emphasis on that later. Yeah, um, so I just kind of want to add on to that um, and talk about like, I guess the start of whiteness um, as an explicit the, um, or an explicit like legitimized social identity in North America um, and yeah so I'm gonna talk about well I want to reference Steve Garner firstly who wrote the book um, Whiteness and Introduction and so he talks about the last decade of the 17th century so um, I guess it was 1619 when I guess the first like, slaves um, came to the US and um, you know, and then you know, Irish indentured servants and, and other indentured servants around, um, I guess, like the European countries. But it wasn't really until the end of the 17th century that we can see like white as a racial identity really like growing and really becoming distinct from um, the African identity. So Steve Garner talks about this time, and he talks about how. Um, colony level legislation against um, voting rights for black people were enacted, race mixing was banned and restrictions on property ownership for black people um, was enacted um, around this time. And so this, in, within this time period, um, um, there was also something called the Bacon's Rebellion. And this is something that Theodore W. Allen documents in his book, The Invention of the White Race. And he talks about the Bacon's Rebellion really being a milestone in the invention of whiteness. Um, and so the Bacon's Rebellion happened between 1676 and 1677. And the rebellion saw an alliance between European indentured servants and Africans who 
basically they were just united by their servitude and however the, these two groups were against native americans in this rebellion in this battle but they were against um i guess the upper european classes but anyway so this this um alliance between the european indentured servants and the african slaves disturbed the ruling classes who responded by hardening the racial castes of slavery in an attempt to div divide the two races from subsequent united uprisings and so this um moment in this rebellion brought forward the virginia slave codes of 1705 so these codes meant that or these these codes established new property rights for slave owners allowed for the, le the legal free trade of slaves with protections granted by the court, established separate courts of trial, prohibited black, um, regardless of free status, status from owning arms, um, meant that whites could not be employed by blacks, allowed for the apprehension of sus suspected runaways. And so here through the Bacon's Rebellion, we can really see like, I guess the white race, because here this is, like the distinction, the Bacon's Rebellion, but also this time, as I said, at the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century, is the time, as I said, that we can see laws and legislation enacted like actively against black people and act actively to um, subjugate black people. So we can see that this kind of, this was almost like the birth of um, a distinguishing, um, the birth of kind of like the the birth of like white identity, I guess, is, is very much distinguishable. And that's very much like interact with um, the ruling class um, maintaining or attaining and wanting social control. Yeah. So um, to further ex make explicit the um, history of indentured servitude, I'm going to focus on the case of the Irish. Um, but the Irish are not the only trans and indentured servants, um, but they're a very explicit example. They're often used. There's a whole book called How the Irish Became White. Um, so basically, from the 1600s, the Irish were already present in the Americas um, as prisoners, as indentured servants, or as priests. Um, and it's, it is assumed that the Irish constituted about 20% of the whole population of the Caribbean in the 17th century, which is a lot. Um, and as mentioned in the indentured servants section, they did work alongside enslaved Africans, but in many cases they were able to rise above uh, their status of indentured servitude um, or laborers of land and become themselves um, owners of slaves. And, you know, for example, words like the word lynching, that comes from lynch, which is an Irish name. So, you know, the, this is obviously very complex. But um, it did take generations for the interests of the English, the Irish and the Scottish to coincide and for free labor to be absolutely synonymous with white and for unfree to be synonymous with black. You know, it, it took a little while for um, that to really get set up but in order to explain kind of where the irish are coming from um so a lot of them are from well, at that time a lot of irish people were from agricultural backgrounds they were a very lo low social class um the they were a british colony and they were seen as inferior and less civilized and as an inferior race by um by the british however that doesn't mean that they were black or that they were treated like black people um, in fact, the reason why mo overall, um, well, like the catalyst for difference uh, when it comes to the Irish was the fact that they were Catholics and um, in the US and in the, and in the in the UK and in the US, the prominent groups were white Anglo-Saxon Protestant groups. Those were the dominant um, groups. And so this narrative of the Irish being, um, because they were Catholics, being kind of primitive and, you know, a little bit behind, um, that narrative was very much alive, actually, in the United States. It wasn't only a UK problem, or, um, I don't know, narrative, yeah. And so this, so, you know, if you know the Irish, you know that there's a lot of Irish people. And so there were very, very strong waves of migration to the United States. Uh, notably, like from the 1830s onwards, 
Um, and it w those, these uh, waves of immigration were so strong that actually Marx and Frederick Douglass um, considered the Irish to be, quote unquote, the Negroes of Europe. Um, and often, th and the reason why they say that is because often in the 1870s in a US context, Irish and African American were often compared and seen and seen to be at similar levels by Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Um, and wait one sec, sorry. I'm sorry about that. My mom is being really sweet and giving me loads of food, but at the same time, she's interrupting. I'm really sorry. Um, so. Um, so yeah, in the 30s, 1830s and 1940s, there was huge, particularly, particularly important migration waves from Ireland to the United States, because in the 40s, there was a famine in Ireland where, I, I can't remember the numbers, but I think it's like over a third of the country left and came to the United States. Um, and so I'm going to try to um, synthesize something that's kind of complex, um, and this is just a very specific example, but just to give you a little bit of an overview of what was going on at that time, in the um, when these Irish people were arriving in the 1830s, 40s in New York, Boston, etc., um, they arrived. They started looking for jobs. They were looking for better opportunities than what they had back home, and they were in competition economically with African Americans, who were the ones who had the jobs that they were aiming for, basically, and. Well, something that's also interesting is that there was ideological difference between those two groups. So Irish people saw the British presence in Ireland and as responsible for their suffering. And they, you know, they, the Irish wanted to get rid of the British and there was a strong anti-British sentiment on, on the Irish part. However, the African, African Americans of the time tended to often see British people as having their interests at, at heart more than their local leaders, which were, you know, uh, the United, here in the, well, there in the United States. So there was a conflict between Irish and African Americans. There was one economic, but also ideological. And I just want to briefly address an argument which is often brought up and stems from that time, which was that Irish claimed to be slaves. And they were not, and they were never slaves. Irish were indeed in poverty, um, they were indeed indentured servants, but that those things are different to slavery. And even back then, they used these arguments, and very much now, it's an argument that is used by Irish Americans, I guess, who kind of say, or even maybe Irish people, you know, who kind of say, like, I mean, it's a, it's an argument that is not used. Um, it's a bit of a like it's a bit of a weird racist like it's it's got racist tendencies this argument it's kind of tend, tends to diminish the reality of slavery but it's just basically historically inaccurate um and so in order to co counter this argument i want to introduce an idea by tony morrison where she argues that when the ships um that were carrying the the, the irish over docked on ellis island they got off and they started this new life in the new world and they very quickly adapted to American culture. She argues that they understood what was at stake in becoming American and by extension becoming white. And so what she says is what she says is that as soon as Irish people and other immigrants too, as soon as they pronounced the N-word, they became white and therefore they became American. Yeah. Now I just want to add on to that. So I want to talk about um, like the migration of European peoples, so sp more specifically like Southern and Eastern European peoples to the Americas at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and I want to talk about a concept of like being in between or like being an in-between person. And so, you know, these people that migrated, um, they did not like fit into the construction of whiteness, but equally they were not black they were you know of they were like the lesser white races um or as i said the in-between races and i think we need to make a note that race and color were often separate but overlapping categories um and steve garner writes that european immigrants became white on arrival in the new world because they disembarked into a new set of social identities that articulated with 
um, with those that they had brought with them. And one overarching identity was whiteness. Um, you know, conversely, there's, there's debate of, about, you know, when um, European immigrants became white. And conversely, David Rhodesia um, does not believe in this, like, white on arrival theory. And he instead suggests that whiteness was something that was learned. Um, it's, this is similar to, you know, what you sort of said with the Toni Morrison kind of quote. And David Rodiger says that the immigrants, like, ticket price for becoming white required them to sacrifice their own heritage and take part in a political alliance which focused on the continued exclusion of non-whites, and most notably African Americans. So here we can see that, you know, white people or, like, Europeans became white through you know, uh, collective like exclusion and, and co yeah, collective exclusion of like African Americans, um, and you know, not being white, um, and being black were very were two very different things, and that's something that you know we also need to note within this time. These European immigrants were not black; they were just didn't fit into the whiteness at the time, and so. I want to talk about um, what Charles Mills says in like one of his books. Um, so basically, this book is Charles Mills, Mills talking about, I guess, like the whiteness of Jews, um, which is something that Aesop's going to mention after this. But um, he says that there is outside outsiders and there is inside outsiders. And the former, so the outside outsiders, are unambiguously non-white. So here it's it's African Americans, it's Native Americans as well. It's um you know it, it's people from India. It's all of these people, and you know the latter, which is inside outsiders, are ambiguously white. And so you know even though at this time you know Eastern and Southern Europeans had to often compete with African Americans for jobs at the lowest ground of the labor market. Um, even, you know, attract themselves attracting slurs such as hunky, which was commonly used to describe Slavic immigrants, they still had the privilege of being somewhat salvageable for whiteness, especially, you know, when we talk about generationally. So, you know, the children of these um, Southern and Eastern um, immigrants, perhaps maybe they um, were put outside you know, the, the bounds of whiteness. But when those immigrants had children, when their children had children, through the generations, they were less distinguishable from white America. Yep. So now I'm just going to brief, very briefly um, touch on the debate over the status of Judaism and Jewish people in the conversation around whiteness. So basically the question is often, are Jewish people white? Um, obviously, Juda and it's very complicated because Judaism is an ethno-religion, so that's where the question kind of comes in. But first of all, I'd just like, I think it's important to point out that there are black Jewish people um, out there and not all Jewish people look white, um, even though, of course, some Jewish people do look white. And um, I think what's, Applicable here is the concept that Lisa just mentioned, which is the concept of ambiguously white. In the cases of those who are um, ambiguously white, uh, this concept works. Um, and Franz Fanon put forward the idea that, quote, the Jew can be unknown for his Jewishness, end quote, meaning the Jewish people can sometimes have the option to identify with whiteness or not, and may therefore sometimes profit from white privilege in some situations without meaning to diminish other forms of oppression that they may or may not have suffered um, or endured. Um, I think this is an important argument to bring up because it's um, anti-Semitism is obvi obviously quite real um, across the globe and the concept of a Jewish race is a little bit complicated because it has both been argued by Jewish nationalists and by um, anti-Semitic people or anti-Semites. Um, and so this, the, I'm, we're just bringing up this point in passing because it just goes to show further, you know, the complexity and the leakiness of not only the concept of race, but also the concept of whiteness. Yep, yeah, so Esau here is talking about the leakiness of whiteness. 
And just to kind of cement that in and to cement, you know, the frivolity of white whiteness, I just want to kind of list um, some cases that are referenced in the book, The Invention of the White Race um, by Theodore W. Allen. And so all of these like um, cases um, just highlight how, you know, as I said, whiteness is, is frivolous. Um, and so in, for example, in colonial Hispanic America, it was possible for a person, regardless of physical appearance, to become white by purchasing a royal certificate of whiteness. Um, according to Virginia law in 1860, um, with just um, one black and so therefore three white grandparents, somebody became a Negro. Um, in 1907, having no more than 15 out of 16 white great grandparents made somebody a Negro. In 1910, every person in whom there is ascertainable, um, wait, let me, let me say that. In 1910, every person in whom there is ascertainable any Negro blood was to be deemed a colored person. And then prior to 1970, a set of Louisiana court decisions dating back to the late 1700s had upheld the legal concepts that any traceable amount of African ancestry defined a Negro. And then in 1970, racial classification became the sub subject of hard bargaining in the Louisiana state legislat legislature. Um, and so the conservatives wanted to push for um, that if you are 164th, we well, have 164th of, of black blood, then you're African American. Um, but then, you know, the as um, Theodore Allen says, the more enlightened opposition forced a compromise at one thirty second of black blood made you a Negro. And that principle was upheld by the state Supreme Court in 1974. So I know that just sounds like a myth like a, a mesh of just um, loads of different facts like thrown at you but I guess each of these points just highlights how like whiteness and the concept of race is so frivolous how it just changes from you know year to year from decade to decade and how it's not something that is is concrete yeah and in order to further reinforce that point I'm going to focus on one really fascinating um, court case um so you know as we've mentioned in our previous seminars um you know there are many anthropologists ethnologists pseudoscientists etc who decided that there was a caucasian race which was superior to all others and of course caucasian was and still is a synonym for white um so there is a man or there was a man called Bagha Bhaghat Singh Thind, I'm sorry, I don't want, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Um, but he was an Indian man who fought in the army, dur in the American army during World War I. He was, in fact, just totally unrelated, but funny fact, it will not funny, but fact, um, he was the first US serviceman to be allowed for religious reasons to wear a turban as part of his military uniform. So just putting, it, putting that out there. Sorry, I'm just going to close my window. Um, so, um, so yeah, so he fought in, fought for the American army in World War I, and he applied to be naturalized like many other soldiers uh, that weren't American in July of 1918. So his argument was that he was an Asian Indian man and that his ethno-linguistic origins were Aryan and Caucasian, and thus that he was white. Um, and it, it's actually quite interesting because Indians were often referred to by anthropologists as Caucasian. So, you know, you'd think he had a pretty good case going for him. So he actually ended up, he did get citizenship in December 1918 um, in the state of Washington. Um, and four days later, it was revoked by the Bureau of uh, Naturalization. Uh, yeah, by the Bureau of Naturalization because he was he wasn't deemed to be white. Um, so he applied again, uh, but in Oregon, 
And the Bureau of Naturalization this time tried to sway the judge by telling the judge that he, by saying to the judge that he was involved in some anti-British propaganda in India. And um, so, yeah, they clearly tried to sway the ruling. And the judge actually overruled them and gave him citizenship in November 1920. And in 1923, the Bureau of Naturalization again took the case to Supreme Court on the basis that, quote, the common, man, the common man's definition of white does not include Indians. And so this time the Supreme Court rejected his claim to whiteness, um, uh, Thin's claim to whiteness, and affirmed that only, quote, blonde Aryans and Caucasians could be naturalized. So what happened is uh, the Supreme Court made it um, a pre-requirement of US citizenship to have Northwestern European ancestry. And basically they made it you know, legal that, you know, to be American, you had to be very clearly white and Western European basically. What happened is that that, and that ruling worked retroactively and 50 Indian people ended up losing their citizenship that they had acquired between 23, 1923 and 1926. Um, and just for the story, um, he actually ended up getting his citizenship finally, and it was never taken away again in 1936. So he did end up getting it. But this, um, this case is just very interesting because it just shows the absolute absurdity of racial classification. This man was arguably more Caucasian than I am, you know, for the literal definition of it. So it just kind of goes show how absurd these words are, it also shows the absurdity, uh, the, the leakiness of the concept of whiteness. And also it finally goes to show the very, you know, how Americanness and whiteness were seen and are seen as, um, you know, one can't go without the other, basically, is what came out of this court case. Yep. So we've been talking a lot about, um, you know, whiteness in America and then in, in the new world. Um, and now I just want to bring it back to like Britain and, and to Europe. Um, so Britain is like a slightly different case to America because obviously, unlike America, which had had a very like mixed racial population due to slavery, Britain's subjects were with within its colonies and also, you know, within the American plantations because, you know, Britain was the main perpetrator of the triangular slave trade. Um, but yeah, basically the, the British population was not as mixed as America. Um, so, however, outwardly, there was a clear distinction between, you know, the idyllic, pure, white metropole and, you know, the dark heathen lands of the colony. And so, you know, inwardly, however, that distinction was a little different. And this is something that Esau is going to talk about in a second. But before that, I just want to mention the influence of American racial distinctions in the UK through cultural imports. Um, obviously, this is just, you know, one contributing factor to um, Britain's kind of, um, Britain's, um, I guess, like belief in, in, in racial differences. Um, so for example, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe's 1852 novel entitled Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, which highlights you know, the color divide and highlights you know, racism in America was also the best selling novel in 19th century Britain. Therefore the ideas um, were transferred and absorbed um, within Britain. Similarly, um, minstrel, so, uh, minstrel shows, which were, were another um, influential cultural import, um, which was where, you know, white people would dress up in blackface and act in a very demeaning manner to kind of um, cement in that inferiority of black people. And that was something that was, um, again, taken by um, Britain and became like a cultural institution of its own like in in britain and this is interesting because obviously and kind of ironic that these cultural imports like kind of provided um like a race divide 
um, within the UK, considering that the UK was you know, arguably the chief colonizer, the, the biggest perpetrator, and it was the UK like initial I ideals of colonialism, imperialism, and a belief in kind of like superiority that led to um, the ideals in America. But yeah, now Esau's going to talk about the UK a bit more. Yeah. So, um, in a colonial context, whiteness was largely wh whiteness as a concept was largely developed on because it was um, it was from a distance looking in. So, outside of Britain, all the British were considered to be white. Um, However, as Lisa said, you know, in Britain itself, it was not so clear, clear cut. So I'm going to be looking at the racial classifications um, based on class that were going on in Britain at this time. So there's a very large body of work uh, written mostly by and for wealthy Victorian men of upper and middle class. And this work um, argues that, mo that working class people um, who are mostly from poor urban areas, are a separate and inferior race to these wealthy Victorian men. This ideology was actually imported from the colonies back into Britain. So abroad, whiteness was synonym to high socioeconomic status. And, and it's almost as though the British realized and developed their whiteness abroad, and they were able to do that because of the profound hierarchical, um, you know, the hi profound hierarchical structures that already existed in Europe. So they brought that over, adapted it, basically created the concept of whiteness, and brought it back home and applied it at home. And so um, the language that Lisa just used two minutes ago, talking about the dark um, colonies and all that, it's so interesting because when you read um, accounts by these men, when, when they travel through London, they use the same language when they're talking about poor urban areas, you know? And as Alistair Bonnet writes, he says they use the language of voyaging and conquest. Um, and so it, it's just very interesting to read. And, a lot of these lower classes were seen very similarly as what was done abroad. They were seen as more primitive, less civilized, less intelligent, and there were characteristics that were drawn out. So for example, the use of language, um, I'm thinking notably of the Welsh situation um, or the Irish situation um, concerning language. Also, the, there was this idea that poor people tended to be criminals um, or drunks or things like that. And there was even some level of phrenology that was used against them in the 1850s, where it was claimed that there were physical differences between these races. So the rich um, British and the, and the poor British, basically. And this again could be used, uh, you know, the, this idea of physical difference, it could be, it could go back to what Lisa was saying about um, skin color due to uh, working outdoors, like, you know, um, being more tanned, whereas uh, bourgeois people could stay inside and keep, preserve their literal whiteness. Um, and so these differences between classes, very similarly to what happened in, in colonialism, these differences justified and legitimized upper class exploitation of the proletariat. But, you know, we're alive here in 2020, so we know that there was a shift at some point, um, and that the people who were at that time excluded from whiteness are now very much included in it, and so there was a shift, and at some point they were deemed worthy of white supremacy, of joining this white supremacy. So this um, academic Bennett argues that um, this shift came with with a shift in the structure of British capitalism. Um, and at that time, whiteness became affordable to working classes. So in other words, imperialism and the welfare state, so basically like post-World War II, so this is like in the 1950s, that's when the um, range of who was included in this full whiteness was broadened. And, um, and so yeah, so arguably it's with a modern post-war capitalist British society that the white working class became, um, well, as Alistair Bonnet says, adopted and adapted whiteness. 
Yeah, so now I kind of want to bring together both like the US and the UK and kind of talk about how we, we came to this this whiteness that we kind of know now. Um, so I guess like the final solidification of, of whiteness that we know today was, it was quite similar um, within the US and within the UK. Um, so in the US, so Rodiga or Rhodesia points to um, as, as Rhodesia points to, um, white America solidified due to the labor mov movement and rise in home buying, therefore you know, direct link to capitalism, but also through changes of race relations, housing and the New Deal. Um, he points to the first half of the 20th century as the point of integration of these formerly like in-between peoples, as I referenced earlier, um, in America. And so one thing that he notes is like the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act of 1924. And so this act was meant to stop um, European, like Southern and Eastern European um, immigrants coming to America. However, it also strengthened white identity because the immigrants that were there became more, you know, naturalized. Like, as I said earlier, you know, as the generations went through, so, you know, their kids, their kids' kids um, became more American. They were able to fit into, um, I guess, the whiteness of America that was previously exclusionary to them. And so um, another thing that Rodiga points to is the New Deal and how, you know, this, I guess, cemented like division between um, white identity and um, black identity or whites or like European immigrant identity and black identity rather. Um, and so, you know, the New Deal, some people talk about the New Deal and they talk about Roosevelt and his, you know, black cabinet and they say that, you know, it was very progressive. However, you know, this deal further divided black, the black and the white working classes or you know black and European working classes and some policies you know directly disadvantaged black people and perpetuated segregation and um, I'm not going to go like fully into the new deal just because of time um but I would ask that you go and research into how like the new deal like negatively affected black people um one I guess show of this is the, the name that black people gave to the NRA and um, the National Recovery Act of the New Deal and they called it the Negro Removal Act which kind of just highlights how it was disadvantaging them. On top of this we can talk about new housing policies which pushed um, European immigrants and their families out of the slum and into the suburbs whereas you know African Americans were excluded from home ownership in the sub suburbs through institutionally racist housing and lending practices. You know, they were, they were denied a lot um, and we see racist housing practices like redlining and, and block busting and things like this. Um, so here, you know, we see this divide between European immigrants and um, the African-Americans just really, really strengthening, um, you know, as a, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the creation of the New Deal, which is arguably you know, somewhat the creation of some sort of social security and similarly within the UK in this like similar time period the Britain's working class um, became like white through national institutions such as um, the National Service League, Territorial Force, also through labour movements, you know, labour unions which strengthened white working class identity but excluded you know others and also the welfare state, as, as East, East or just like briefly mentioned, because the welfare state kind of brought this air of like nationalism, it tied them to something and it made them feel a part of something. And so, yeah, so this was arguably the time that, um, I guess, the, the whiteness that we know was like fully, fully solidified. Yeah, so um, just to kind of pull this all back, Together, um, yeah, in post World War II, you know, formal decolonization was starting to happen. Um, as Lisa said, this welfare state was set up. So, um, yeah, it created this strong nationalist feeling, not only in Britain, but also in places like France and um, I'm not sure where else, but uh, yeah. And um, 
because formal decolonization was going on, there was also very high um, migration patterns from former colonies to Europe and to um, imperial powers in Europe. And so this really challenged this very new welfare state and British people and French people uh, didn't really want to share it. And so, you know, traditionally, like on paper, um, the welfare state is designed to help those who need it the most. Um, and we know the Western society is one which is highly individualized, you know, we fight for individual freedoms, things like that. Um, and so here I just kind of want to introduce um, W.E.B. Du Bois's, um, you know, what he says on racial capitalism, which is the idea that white working classes really are dupes to protect whiteness even though the system really isn't beneficial to them and of course you know in today's terms um white poor white people possess white privilege or they possess advantages because they are white but yet they remain poor and we know that the system doesn't care about them and laura polito who's a mexican um academic, um, you know, she also argues that um, the fact that there is a growing working class or a shrinking middle class doesn't mean the demise of racism, but rather its new deployments. Um, that's a quote. And, um, and so I'd just like to conclude by basically saying that whiteness works by recruitment. And um, we've said this um, quote before, but I think it's very good. Um, it's a quote by Malcolm X, which goes, racism is like a Cadillac. There's a new model every year. And, you know, what I interpret from that is that white supremacy is a very highly adaptable system. And as Lisa said, there's a new, it literally changes every year and um, it changes according to societal needs and um, to what it, what, it, what it needs to maintain itself. It's, um, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy system. And um, it's, you know, whiteness is traditionally and is still associated with purity, cleanliness, religiosity. Um, and this is why it was able to exclude and later include um, so many different groups. So like, you know, back in, the day, back in the day, the Irish, the Italians and the Greeks, they didn't have the right religion or, you know, they didn't have the right branch of the right religion. And uh, eventually that wasn't too much of an issue anymore. So they were included in whiteness. Jewish people didn't have the right religion either, but sometimes they can be included, sometimes not. Um, poor people were seen as dirty because of the work that they had to engage in um, and because of their class, you know, compared to bourgeois people. And yet they were eventually also included in whiteness. So this is just kind of to, to, to show the highly adaptable um, characteristic that white supremacy has. And um, yeah, just to conclude, I think I'd just like to yeah, finish on the idea that, you know, back, back in the Victorian era, or maybe even before, whiteness was thought of as an extraordinary quality. That idea hasn't really kept, you know, it's kind of dissipated since. But uh, the same person, Alistair Bennett, argues that um, this exceptionalism has now become a very normalized exceptionalism and that white supremacy is an ordinarily supremacist identity. And that is um, kind of what it looks like today. Yeah, um, I just want to add, and I hope you don't disagree with me, Esau, um, you kind of said um, that the idea of whiteness changed to because of societal needs, but I guess it's more because of like the needs of the ruling elite yeah, that yeah. bestowed those, you know, yeah, that's societal what needs on on the normal people. So I know you didn't don't just no, you right. just wanted to cement that mm -hmm. in the voice confusion. But yeah. Yeah, we hope that this was um it's it's a lot of information, but um we hope that it was a bit of an overview of what changed and shifted and uh yeah let us know if you have anything to add or any questions or edwin if you want to tell us about south african whiteness <laughs> but yeah thank thank you for that ladies um i think it's a well done to you um i'm just a bit um perplexed with 
how difficult it is to uh, get the narrative behind where whiteness emanates from. Mm. And it, uh, I think it boils down to how ridiculous whiteness is in essence that we have to struggle to get some form of history because a lot of things you can go in history and uh, there's a sequence that will lead you to where you need to be in order to understand something. But with this, it, it's so blown out of nothing and made up of nothing that it's difficult to find something <laughs> to establish some form of uh, 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 thinking behind why it, 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 it became. But uh, I like the quote from my Malcolm X about um, every year there's a new one. Because that, that is absolutely what we've been experiencing in South Africa. So our whites came on a boat to South Africa and never left. Um, they're still here. Um, all with European uh, uh, connectivity. Um, and under apartheid, which was like segregation, um, they obviously then uh, generally populated our land and under apartheid took control of the land and enslaved our people. Um, and even today, um, and just to, to, to get to my point where it, um, it morphs into a new being as soon as something difficult comes and challenges um, the status quo. So um, as soon as apartheid was brought to its knees and apartheid was removed and we came into a uh, democratic uh, um, state, whiteness had to change because it was not a superior uh, 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 um, method of control that was used so it had to change but the funny thing is even within morphing into something new the one thing that whiteness maintains is that power to oppress black people and that's the one i think within understanding whiteness that we need to figure out on how do we because look, many things you can kill. You can kill something and it's dead and it's gone. But uh, racism and white supremacy is something that it's, it seems like it's impossible to kill it. And we get that it's institutionalized and it has moved because it's so deeply entrenched into society and everything that we know. I get that, we all get that, but it's becoming ridiculous because if everything else has an expiry date, how is it so difficult to get one stamped onto to whiteness? Um, so yeah, so we need to find, uh, you know, it's like, uh, um, I don't have a good movie quote to use here now, but I think it's where you get to the final stage of a game and you have to kill this final master to get the reward. We need to figure out what that is with whiteness. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Edwin. And I think it's it's interesting that you say, you know, the commonality of, of whiteness. You know, we've talked about, I guess, the change of whiteness throughout time from like the 16th century to today. And, you know, you, you're saying that the only thing that stayed the same is the, the suppression of, of black people. And this is something that I think it's, it's either David Rodiga or um, Theodore Allen who says that, um, the only certainty in the whiteness and the changing of whiteness is that black people are, are at the bottom. And so, you know, even though throughout the seminar we're talking about how the, the power shifts um, kind of changed within whiteness itself, yeah, I think we need to, yeah, cement in the fact that black people were still always at the bottom of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think to add, we were thinking initially of ending on um, a Toni Morrison like snippet of an interview, and I think it's an interview that she was doing at the time of The Bluest Eye. And um, it's an interview with Charlie Rose, and maybe you've seen it, we actually shared it on our page uh, yesterday. And we were, it, basically in that interview she says, you know, I think it's because Charlie Rose asks him like, oh, something like oh what should we do about black oppression or so, something so vague and she says this is this is the wrong question you have to ask yourself how you feel how and basically what she's arguing is something that i think france Fanon would disagree with because she she says that it's um 
whiteness is a very profound disease of the psyche. You know, it's something that at the, you know, it's something within white people that is profoundly wrong with us. And I, obviously it's, a, you know, you as an individual did not invent it, but you were the recipient of it. And so you obviously have a part in it, but it's very much, I feel, and I feel like, at least as a white person, I feel like this, um, this uh, big giant that you have to slay that you're talking about is, is that. It's actually within myself. Like at the end of the day, I can argue with the Ku Klux Klan member as much as I want. It's more, at least uh, this is where I'm at at the moment. It's more within myself. How has this really, really been so embedded in our, in our psyches, all of us, you know, it's very, so yeah. <laughs> I like that uh, analogy, Aesop, where you say that um, uh, the dragon that you need to slay at the end of the game is more or less your own mm. privilege or your own uh, existence in uh, how you came to be and understand. The difficulty with that is, is Aesop in yourself and many of the white people that is part of this group and many other groups. We have so many uh, white people that are willingly participating in these conversations, taking part in Black Lives Matter. And yet, even with so many crossing the border, you know, it's funny, the bigger the group becomes that is fighting the war, the more we expect to win the war and to have impact. But the funny thing is, the whiteness has become so crude in the way that it morphs that as soon as the powerful became become a little bit or, or the oppressed uh, gain some power there's always a carrot that needs to be dangled and then some of us split up and we lose that ground and we see it now with black lives matter we are growing across the world and yet the oppression has not necessarily subsided so you, you, for example, you see legislation has changed in America, you see this has changed, that has changed, and yet the status quo remain. So uh, um, I don't know, something that will change the world forever. How do we get COVID-19 in a whiteness form? Mm -hmm. what, what do we give to people? What type of disease that do we need to infect white people with? So that we have a COVID-19 situation which spreads so fast that people are literally changing every aspect of their lives in order to finally and once and for all slay the dragon of white supremacy and, and, and anything that goes together with whiteness. So that's, I think, our magic pull that we need. COVID whiteness. Yeah. That's a great... I think it's, um... <laughs> What's the word? Um, analogy. analogy. Yeah, it's a great. Uh, yeah, a good point. It works. I've heard it for climate change, but not for white supremacy. It's um, yeah, very much. Yeah, Maya. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'd I'd love to ask a question. Thank you. That was super interesting. I'm very very new to all of this history, so. One of the things I just wanted, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more on is, so when you talk about adapting and adopting whiteness, particularly when you're talking about, obviously people who are white, but they're like lower class or, um, I guess this is something that I would understand more if I'd done more reading about, but what is it that they're adopting? Is it just power? Is it literally being defined by an authority as white or what is it that you mean there? I think at that particular point, when, when I said that, I think I was more talking about actually, like, I think, you know, if you go like back in the, in the 1800, like 1820, for example, you go to London, you ask some guy on a farm, are you white? He's not going to know. Like, he's just going to be like, what are you really like talking about? Which to us sounds, of mm -hmm. course, but you know, that sounds almost absurd because we know how white we are. But, um, and so I think that's more what we're talking about here is the, I get by adapt, it's more, it adapts all the time. But when, when I said that the white working class adopted and adapted, it's actually a quote by um, 
Alistair Bennett, and we always give all the resources so we can send that. But uh, he, I think what he's talking about there, what I was talking about there is very much, yeah, um, seeing yourself as white and like mm. actually um, saying I am a white man, you know? Yeah, and, and I think, I think just to add on that, I think it's also interesting to note, so like when I was doing research, um, I can't remember where where I, where I found it, but I'll put all the resor- resources up. But it was talking about how we need to distinguish between when we talk about whiteness. Are we talking about that in a cultural sense? Are we talking about that in a um, a legal sense? Like, are we talking about that in a a social sense? Like, what what in an economic sense? Like, how are we talking about that whiteness? And I guess like through this, like I mean, as I said, through all of this and the whole, um, I guess evolution of whiteness um in terms of like power structure black people were still at the bottom i guess white people um within that collective of whiteness i guess the power like shifted a little bit but still Hmm. um you know there was still um i guess above above black people in that sense but um yeah i think as well you know through a lot of this we're talking about like how people were perceived and how people were perceive themselves. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, does anybody have anything else to add to the question? Uh, I think it's also in, um, interesting to understand that um, this adaptation and adopting shows that whiteness, um, the basis for whiteness um, is not very concrete. And that power and economic power also played a role in how whiteness was defined Mm -hmm. at certain times. And for example, in South Africa under apartheid, um, Chinese, the Chinese people could uh, pass as white because they were, uh, they could use their financial ability to obtain some of that quality education um, and that quality um, resources that was set aside for whites only. So I think it also speaks to that fact that it, it there's nothing concrete about it. We all know that race is something that is scientifically provable but we know that color, colorism is something that was made up and sucked out of, out of the thumbs um, um, on a whim one day. And that is how whiteness has become something. So it further shows how it doesn't have real substance, but it has become so powerful that even that which is scientific cannot outmaneuver or outpace it. And um, yeah, I think today it's more clear cut. Um, where we, a certain um, picture of what whiteness is, is certainly what we accept. For example, um, you spoke about the Irish and you spoke about, um, I can think of people in Germany and other places that um, even though uh, also the Portuguese, their hair structure and, and, and texture is much like ours, which is the colored people um, or people of color um, and would be more closely associated with us, but because their skin are fairer than what ours are, when they do come into a certain group, then they will pass as white. So I think that also shows that across borders, it changes to some extent, but there's a certain picture of uh, paleness that we accept as white and you will automatically pass for that. But then it also boils down to some judgment because um, I don't know um, if you know the term, um, uh, I'll tell you now. Um, So this is a a disease that we have where people lose their pigmentation. Um, uh, Revitiligo. Not not that, so it's different. I'll think about albino. Oh, yes. Yes. So albinism, um, where people become that type of fair and even more, but that doesn't classify as whiteness. 
Mm-hmm. So there's that clear understanding of what whiteness looks like, what the pitch of whiteness is, and that's the only acceptable uh, um, things that are that you can put forth as being white. Um, and and yeah, so that is one of those things. And sometimes it clashes where where people have one and not the other. But depending on which one you have, you can still go through. For example, some of the Latina ladies have all the features of whiteness but when they speak <laughs> they have the latino um twang in, in 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 the way they speak and that will automatically um, exclude them from being a white so yeah it's it's crazy it doesn't make sense mm-hmm. has anybody got any other questions comments thoughts critiques and if you don't want to argue free to write them down in the chat and we can read them out mm-hmm. yeah, i think that is a good point um edwin when yeah. you spoke about um albinism as like kind of almost like this catalyst of like look at how absurd this is you know it's obviously like it's not Mm. color but it's not about science it's not about culture it, it's 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 nothing it's nothing it's literally nothing but yeah um, yeah and like i guess going back to like obviously we didn't touch this in this seminar but going back to what we said in the first seminar like i mean pseudoscience was literally just like the catalyst for these um you know racial distinctions between black and white people and it literally has no scientific basis it was literally just created to subjugate black people literally for their control and so you know it is like literally it is absurd it's it's arbitrary it's completely random it's like the white ruling classes decided that in order to get power they needed to create this distinction Mm. it is in fact a lie it's a lie it's an entire system based on a lie and like, you know, that lie has taken many forms and it's been told to many people in different ways, but it is always the same lie. And, you know, you kind of find it again, like when African-Americans were fighting for their rights and stuff, they were told, oh, don't worry, like, just wait, just wait, just wait. And I feel like even that is the same lie being like, oh, we'll help you. We'll like, you know, it's, um, yeah, I think it's, it's yeah. Weird. But I mean, you could go far, yeah, and argue that even just, you know, now within this Black Lives Matter movement where they're throwing you a, f- a few c- crumbs just to like, you know, sedic- just to like silence you, you could say that's almost, that's another lie. Like, you're not actually going to change the system. The system is still there and it's still a system which is oppressing Black people and putting white people above that and giving them privilege in society. So, you know, doing these these little things to try and destroy racism to me it seems like also absurd like but that's that's me i i honestly don't think that you can destroy racism within this structure that we have um yeah like i kind of wonder what you're talking about when you're saying that people then choose to to adopt and adapt whiteness this feeling of choosing to choose that as your primary identity rather than having something else as your primary identity. And that coming because you're either because there's a transaction in it, like you're going to get something out of it, um, some crumbs thrown to you or, or because of fear. Right. I can, I imagine. Um, And I wonder, I kind of feel also based on what you were saying, so like the, the, the th- and what Tony Morrison was saying about having to turn in and say, well, why is it that we need to create this, this construct? It's like that will never go until we lose our fear or until we choose that something else is more important than our fear or than our material gain, which, yeah, it feels like we have a lot of work to do before that's going to happen. Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit wary of it, but actually in that snippet of that interview, she says, um, so she talks about like, um, 
black people needing to heal. She, she says very explicitly, she says, I'm not a victim, but she does mm -hmm. talk about healing and things like that. And actually, I believe that white people really need to heal from this because it's a lie that has re like you know I, th I i feel like when i look at my life you know if i if, if i've been able to do some of the things i've been able to do it's because i've been told oh you, you're special you can do these things but mm. that is a lie isn't it you know you know it's kind of and so we all need like there's this um yeah we need of course people of color need to heal from the suffering, but we need to heal as abusers, if you kind of see what I mean. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I'd be wary of using the word heal. I get the sentiment, yeah, I'm wary of but it. I feel like I'd be wary of using that word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more like, I don't know. It's, yeah, I don't know. it's not... Need to come to terms. Yeah. But no, I agree with the sentiment, but yeah, we need to like come to terms with it. Yeah, come to terms with it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and to some extent, repent. Um, mm. uh, in, in some sense, that, that's also a good word. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I think it's, it's a difficult one because I also think um, what you, uh, you mentioned in, in the presentation about um, this idea of this white supremacy and living that being a form of a mental illness. Um, I think that is something that is genuinely a true thing that exists. I think it, 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 it's the nature of an illness. If you break it down, for example, depression, and, and you take, for example, what the DSM-5 will ascribe to what you need to have in order to be um, diagnosed with that illness. When you look at white supremacy and white privilege, what you need to have in order to be um, diagnosed with that superior, superiority complex, I think we will get there. And then we can look at how do you actually undo that and how do you medicate for that illness? Because that's what we need. I mean, it's, it's, this is not even in my mind very powerful to me. It's just that this is an illness because as you say, it's based off a lie. So just think about it in any other terms. If you go around in any other aspect of life, pretending to be a lawyer, lying, uh, pretending to be a police officer, lying, that you are one, what would be the consequences of that? How would people perceive you if you walk into a courtroom and the judge is in front and you walk in as if you are the judge and you act that way? There's something mentally wrong with you. And that's what white people do. They literally walk into a room and become the lie that is the truth of everybody else. Even if it's not, it's clear. Everybody can see, no, 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 no. This is not true. That is the truth in front of us. White people will still take up that space and become their truth. So then the question is, this Kanye West, he's his mental outburst. It's not normal. You, you see it not to be normal. But that is how black people experience white supremacy. The same way. But we, why aren't we addressing it in the same way? Why don't we call it out in the same way? So yeah, these are some of the complex things that uh, turns my screws in my brain and bring the smoke out my ears. <laughs> I think that's interesting as well and like you know the fact that people don't even notice it's only really until now you know with this Black Lives Matter movement well in, in recent times anyway that the people are, are becoming or acknowledging their white privilege and you know this is something that's so normalized like it's so it's literally normality like whiteness and white privilege is the status quo as Steve Garner says it's the Greenwich mean time of identity and so you know you need to take away you need to like really kind of look inside and introspect introspect and take away that very destructive brutal brutally racist like oppressive um trait or oppressive yeah a trait for for use for a better word um that is within you and that's yeah yeah you need to deconstruct but uh, yeah 
that's that's done. I'm done. <laughs> cool. Cool. Thank you. That's the most fun. Mm -hmm. But also, I want to add that. Um, I guess within that, um, you know, that's not to that's not to make white people feel guilty because I don't think that's a productive um, way to go. I don't think feeling guilt is necessarily conducive. If or if you're using that guilt and then you're going to push for something, then that's great. But you know, it, I'm not saying this, and I guess we're not saying this in order to make white people feel guilty. I think they should just acknowledge this systemic privilege that they have have and then try and well not try they should actively um, work to change that and actively recognize and push themselves in in an anti-racist direction um you know feeling guilty isn't going to do, do anything being upset is not going to do anything but actually pushing and actively being anti-racist is going to do something yeah. But it's interesting because a lot of these conversations about, quote, what people do is kind of basic decency, like human decency most of the time that people are asking for, you know, it's kind of like, you know, it's, you made a mistake, you said something racist, or you did something questionable or whatever, you can apologize, you can feel guilty, but just show up with changed behavior. And yet, yeah, as you're saying it, when here we are 400 years later with no change behavior. And still... Uh, the, yeah, the problem is, is of, I think, and this is the crux of the matter, on why I, I think, as I said earlier, bringing change is not something too complex. Learning a new habit takes about six weeks or something like that scientifically proven it takes about six weeks or something like that even less i might be wrong um to learn new habit or unlearn old habits so it's not impossible the reason why i think why people refuse to undo the privilege that they receive daily or fight actively to change it daily is one the fear of losing control and power, and two, the fear of losing economic superiority. Mm. And with the acknowledgement of all the past uh, 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 trauma that has been inflicted on black people comes reparations. And those are some of the things that white people find, in my opinion, studying white people academically, I find that those are the underlying issues that white people refuse to openly speak about um, that hampers them actively overthrowing the system that they know is flawed because they'll come out. I mean, white people will come out on any given day of the week and acknowledge oppression, acknowledge racism, acknowledge that there need to be a, a time of healing for black people and doing better and yet they will go right back into their privileged position and live their privileged lives without ever changing anything else so then the question is what at the heart of that is keeping them back and will they holding that final step of being actively part of the the transformation and I think at the heart of that is that economic power that they have and their social power that they have. They are not willing to give up that. And that's why the, when you speak, Lisa, about the crumbs that we get, they are willing to give you that little bit because for some of us, that is the ultimate power when we get that crumb. But we, we also lose focus then on the bread that's still on the table. Um, and, and that's the, the power of, of playing this game for over five, six hundred years. They know how to do it. And we're always at the disadvantage. Yeah, thank you, Edwin. I guess it goes back as well to, you know, again, going back to this Toni Morrison video, but she says, you know, 
if people um, only feel tall when I don't know, they, they make other people people feel small or if they're standing on somebody's like shoulders or something like that then the, there's something really wrong with that and yeah it is is giving away something isn't it like you're tall because you're standing on somebody you know and so maybe that is something that people don't want to give away they're, they're quite happy happy to live in their privileged position mm-hmm. if you're only tall because someone is on their knees is on their knees yeah. I, I was I saw something and I'm, I'm trying to think, I don't know where it was from but it was somebody saying that they asked their friends like oh it, their white friends like oh if you were to give 10 percent of your privilege you know the question is a bit absurd you know but she, to, this person was saying if you were to give 10 percent of your privilege to black people would you do it and I, I can't. I really can't. I can't credit anyone because I really can't remember where where I saw this. But um, but they were saying that a lot of their friends said like, oh, what ten percent though? Like it de- it depends what ten percent it is. And it's just that's mad. That's really just insane. The the answer should be yes, of course, because a hundred percent of it is owed. So it's kind of I don't, it's just yeah. I think reparations is definitely. Um, people have not come to terms with that or i think they don't actually realize that um it is due you know i think we're not really ready like the conversation is not had Uh, and distorted histories also doesn't help us Mm -hmm. so um when when you thought that what you have is because of hard work and perseverance of your kind, or your people. Um, then obviously, when people speak about reparations and um, giving back that was stolen or, or taken, it becomes a question of, I did not take anything from anybody. I grew up as an English boy working hard. We didn't take anything from anybody. So. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complex, multiple level issue that we need to address where we address the history, then we address the rep- Edwin, you're, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I got muted in between or... You're saying the- you need to address the history, the... Yeah. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I, you see, that's what happened when you start talking truth. I mean, the devil comes in. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's, it's multi-level, multi-layered. When you address that history, you need to address everything else that is connected to that. And I think that is the thing. It's, for example, um, uh, for I steal your car, Lisa. Uh, so I, I steal your car and I'm driving with the car. It's lovely. I go to work every day and it's doing its thing for me or whatever I do with it. I party or whatever. Um, and then I walk up to you and you're like, dude, that's my car. And I'm like, so sorry, man. I didn't know, but I'll check you later. And I'm off. I'm like, it's my car. It's, I, I want my car, you know? And and that's what we don't get. The, the people that took the car, they don't want to give the car. <laughs> they keep holding on to my car. So, I mean, it's difficult. I, I understand because if you give me back my car that you took, you have to walk. And people, people don't want to go into that, you know? Why would you discomfort your own life by making those who have been oppressed all along or suffering all along better. And that's why they can't give you that 10% because what do I give? I love it. And that's that's something, Maya, to your question, um, uh, almost if all of us could have, and, and somebody has said this, and I also don't know who to credit for this, but I think many people have said it in the past, if we all had to choose black people in terms of what color we could be, I think we all would have wanted to be white because it's just so amazing being white. 
and then we don't have to deal with all the issues that we've had for the past 600 years. And, and that's how crazy that is, because honestly speaking, we love who we are. We wouldn't want to be anybody else, but just for the comfort and the privilege and having everything else that white people have, we probably would have had all of that. George Floyd would have wanted to be white, just not to have been killed like that on the street. Um, Nelson Mandela would have wanted to be white just not to have gone to prison for 27 years. It's not sensible, but I mean, that's the only way we could have survived that moment. Possibly if we were white. Crazy. Has anybody got anything to add? Any questions? You can write them in the chat if you're shy about anything to do with racism, white privilege. If not, we might have a short end today, a quick end. If no one else had um, I'd love to know a little bit more about um, about you guys and how you started this up and what your history is. I saw, yeah, I saw a little bit about it, but I, I can't remember how I came across your page. So I thought it was interesting. So. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so me and Esau, we knew each other, or we've known each other for a few, for a few years, we were at uni, um, and... Basically, I don't know, how did we even start this, Iso? Um, We started it because basically a year ago we came back from a festival and I suggested that we, um, I like just threw out the idea, so we used to live together so we know each other quite well, we have similar interests and stuff and I just kind of threw out this idea like, oh, why don't we organize a white shop, a workshop to get white people thinking about white supremacy? And it was coming back from a festival. So like, you know, sometimes festivals are kind of cultural appropriation central. And I think that was kind of what was going on in my mind at that time. And, um, and yes, yeah, so like kind of at that point, we were kind of thinking about what, what could the workshop look like, things like that. And then Lisa went off to Zambia for a big chunk of this year. And then during confinement, we just thought, wait, everybody's stuck at home in front of their computers. It's um, a good time to do it. So. So, yeah, but I think we're both actively, um, you know, try to be anti-racist. I mean, I guess, um, I mean, I'm like a journalist and do like other creative things and like through like my medium of, or like all the mediums that I, that I, wow, my brain's gone dead. I'm a journalist and I guess through that medium, like I'm always exploring, you know, issues of kind of like marginalization and a lot of the times I'm exploring race through that, um, like, I grew up in a very white area in like the east of England, so very noticeable for me, like um, the issue of race, I guess. Um, and yeah, I think Esau as well um, is very interested in, in race academically. Mm. So I think it just, it just worked out. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, coming from two different racial perspectives is quite interesting, I think. Yeah. Yeah, we actually have a question from Jada, which is, um, how would you tackle the issue of white fragility and outrage when discussing affirmative action? <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like Jada might be saying this because of a, a recent incident like, over social media. But basically, I was, I was talking about this, this issue of affirmative action. And I was saying, you know, um, you know affirmative action is literally, it's, it's reparations, you know? Like it's literally giving some somebody something that has been, you know, denied that thing for so long. And I always love to bring it back to the Lyndon B. Johnson quote. And I will say it again because again, I'm not like venerating Lyndon B. Johnson, but it's like a good quote. And I always just have to say that. Um, but basically he says if you're you have two people at the start of the race one of those people is like shackled and then the other one is just you know free and you tell them to run 
to finish the race and you know obviously the free person um finishes first and you say to the shackled person oh you know how come you're not finishing the race at the same same time blah 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 you know obviously those people are disadvantaged in society one of them has got a weight of oppressive factors like laying on them and so you can't expect people to get to the same place at the same time like meritocracy doesn't really make any sense because you know if I myself me and Esau are from the same area we go to the same school same uni we're literally exact like equal in except from the color of our skin Esau is gonna reap more benefits than I am purely because of the color of my skin and so you know when we have if, like affirmative action that is just you know, it, it's necessary to to um, filling in that that gap to to balancing it out. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of of white fragility around that area because you know white people believe that there's something being taken from them. And again, it goes back to what what we were saying, what Edwin was saying, and and what we were all saying about people don't like losing something. You know, they're comfortable. Like whiteness is comfortability. It's literally just like the normality. It's their status quo. And when somebody takes something away from that comfortability, they're shook. They want it back. They don't want um like a disturbance in their equilibrium and they don't care about you know, the next person um, going above, the next person gaining something that they didn't have initially. People just want what they want. And it's interesting as well, even with people that claim to be kind of anti-racist, you know, what are you willing to lose? Yeah, what are you willing to, to lose from this society? Um, and yeah, how would you tackle the issue of white fragility and outrage when discussing affirmative action? I mean, I would just keep telling them that they're wrong, but obviously in an explaining why, um, you know, it's needed and explaining like, you know, the, the structure that, that we have and how it disadvantages people. Um, but yeah, white fragility, you know, like how do you deal with white fragility? Like especially as a person of color obviously it's harder for me to deal with it maybe people listen to Esalt more um on that and maybe that will be a different experience but honestly to white fragility like that's not something that I need to stress myself out about that's their problem I can't do anything I'm not gonna like spend my time like you know trying to inject something in, in somebody that's either crying or they're upset or they're stressed or they're being defensive then that's something that they need to work on and it goes back to what Esau sort of said about you know the Toni Morrison thing you know where the interviewer asked Toni Morrison you know like something about like what can we do or blah 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 and she goes you know that's that's you that's a you problem you need to sort that out there's enough resources um out there and if you're not willing to listen to a black person then why like then you're you're not anti-racist you're just perpetuating your white privilege um yeah so i don't know if that answered anything um there's another um question which is i must have misunderstood the analogies i must have misunderstood the analogies but they seem to suggest privilege should be handed back to black people but surely having the inverted scenario is not a sustainable solution since it, since it would mean the oppression of whites. What would the ideal solution look like? I probably understood the analogies the wrong way. Don't base yourself like that. <laughs> um, the only thing that I would say that comes to mind, and I think, um, I don't know if you were here um, last time when we said that, but it was, um, it's, the example, it's the example of Haiti, because, it, for, it, for me, it's, a, it's, it's just a good example for reparations because um, basically Haiti got their independence in, so they're the first island, um, it, it was an island of enslaved people who got their own independence themselves. The way that they got it was by killing the white people that were dominating the island and they got their independence in 1794 and the French government so it was a French colony. The French government abolished slavery for the first time in 1802 or 1804, I think. And then they reinst... No, I've got it wrong. They abolished slavery the same year and they reinstated it in 1804. Something like that, I can't remember. And what they did 
so they reinstated it for another like 40 years, 45 years, from 1804 to 1848, that's it. And in 1825, they asked Haiti to pay a debt of $21 billion in today's money um, because of the property that they'd lost, which was um, human life and, hum you know, it was the humans that they'd lost, basically, and all the land, etc. cetera. And, um, and now France is all surprised that um, Haiti is the poorest country in the world. And it's like, but between the 20, sorry? In the Western Hemisphere. Oh, in the Western Hemisphere. But yeah, between 1825 and 1947, they had to pay such an insane debt. And it's, I don't know, it's just, um, yeah. Yeah, it is insane. <laughs> um, yeah, and so this is the case of Haiti, but there's also, you know, Jamaica. And yeah. we have, in France, we have we call it the France Afrique, which is um, the fact that um, uh, they still, the currency that is used in many, many Francophone West African countries is still, it still depends on the euro. And, um, you know, this is obviously rooted in like colonial, um, like currencies based on gold and things like that. Anyway, it's like, but also to add, uh, oh, sorry, Edwin, you, you go. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to say to, to Paul, uh, <laughs> uh, it's something that, that Reverend Farah Khan says um, in, in, in an interview, um, I think it was in the 70s, where um, some, somebody was also making the difference that if black people got their privilege and the power, they will oppress white people. But then he makes the example that the only reason you're thinking that way is because of your white understanding of how power works. Um, it's not to say that black people will take whatever power they get to oppress white people. That's the white thing to do. Mm -hmm. White people came up with oppressing black people. Black people never came up with oppressing white people. So in essence, uh, you would never know what black people will do when they do have economic power or get their privilege back, which they never had. I don't know how you give something back that we've never had um, per se. Um, we were just living before we were colonized and oppressed. So to answer your question to some extent, the analogy is not for black people to get white people's privilege and obtain privilege from white people and then oppress them. The idea is to bring it forth reparations for all the theft um, uh, to the extent that Isolde is ma mentioning where countries were uh, literally crippled economically by uh, 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 the West. Um, and now while we're living in a world where we're questioning these things, we are saying, let's um, do some reparations and give an opportunity for those countries to now find a way to sustain themselves. But also in the process, we also abused, oppressed, and um, uh, uh, um, took the economic power away from black people specifically. And then we say, let's find a way to bring equity, and not equality, equity, because equality speaks to something totally different. Equity is when the least in society are given enough to come up to par or to some extent with the rest of society that is the middle class or the elite. Um, so that is basically what we're saying. Just let's share the wealth amongst all of us so that all of us can have more opportunities to fight in this, the, the, in this world where the strongest will survive. Because when the resources are, are made available to all people, then we get fair opportunity. But black people have never seen that um, over the last 600 years. And that's why we're now calling for it, because we are literally fed up. So you don't have to give all your privilege back to us, uh, 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 Boston, Boston Paul. Um, I'll just take the ten percent. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, like to jump off what you're saying, um, concern. Yeah, to jump off what you're saying, like black people aren't asking for revenge, you know, and they could. And in fact, if where the tables turned, we probably would be asking for revenge because that is what we've, you know, I don't know, at, what is being asked for is justice. And so it kind of goes to show that, um, yeah, I think that was a very um, interesting comment you made about seeing power 
in a very white way, you know, because that's and it's kind of similar to um you know I, I don't know if you guys have seen that i've often seen these caricatures when it um when talking about um migration into europe and people being like the only reason you don't want migrants to come to europe is because because you think they're going to steal your jobs and pillage and whatever it's because that's what you did to them and i don't know it's just a very similar thing you're worried that that's what they're going to do to you because that's the only way you've ever done things and also I just want to add on, on to that, um, you know, if, for example, Britain throws a little bit of money or whatever to, I don't know, an African country or to a Caribbean country, um, still, the, it would have to be a lot of, of reparations because still the way that the world is designed is that the UK is literally... Um, oppressing that, that we I mean we say colonialism is over but you know we're in a, a neo-colonialism in the sense that the UK is still very much exploiting and oppressing oppressing like for example the African continent and still you know a lot of businesses um like that are from the UK are going in and, and taking like the resources within an African context similarly you know to the recent like Chinese presence in Africa so still you know if we're talking about giving money back, the system is arguably still going to be that of oppression. You need like a complete overhaul in, in mentality to change that. Because I can't see like European powers ever giving away like the deserved amount of money. If this reparations movement ever, you know, um, kind of penetrated a little bit into like the... Sorry, something if they if the if this reparations movement and ever managed to penetrate like a little bit into like you know europe and and the social order i i don't ever see it being so much that it would like i don't ever see it being the full amount that is owed and so in that sense there's still going to be taking from black people in some way the system is still going to be built on oppression and so i again i'm always in every seminar, I'm always bringing it back to capitalism and, and the, 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 the social order and the economic order that we have. Still, there's oppression there. It's, it's a system of oppression. It's a system of exploitation. It's a system of inequality. So you're not going to change that by maybe taking a bit of money and throwing it here. The only way you're going to change that is to make a new system. This system was created, you know, again, I want to say the quote, which I've said before, you know, the system is not broken it's working how it was designed to work and that's by oppressing people you know yeah. yeah and also just to add briefly like concerning the actual amount of reparations like the money that was generated with especially slavery but also like colonialism is unheard of in any other time place space context like they never saw that amount of money and even like um, what's the name of that king? Um, the Malian king who like had like, yeah, yeah, that guy. He um, he like even his amount of money is not even anywhere near comparable to just like the money that Bordeaux or Nantes made of slavery. You know, like these are individual cities. Oh. Like, you know, it's really. So I, I I don't think that actual financial reparation is not it, it's it's not it's definitely not going to happen in capitalism and it's not like I don't think it's even possible because no. of the like how much they generated. I I don't think we'll ever see that type of money, Lisa or Esau. Yeah. I don't think we'll ever get there. Um, I don't think any of the Western countries will do reparations in the way that it will tip the scale in any other country's favor. That will never happen. And you see how this capitalist system uh, also now rearing its ugly head in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, where as soon as we heard that there is the slightest chance of a vaccination coming out soon, the West has been buying up millions and millions and millions of these uh, um, 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 vaccines. Um, so now, obviously, what will happen is that the West will be um, taken care of um, against the, the virus by buying up all these things and Africa will be left last because we don't have the money and the financial cap capacity to, um, to compete at that level. So um, yeah, these things, it is same like whiteness, 
that has the same uh, capability to morph into what it wants to be, but the system remains the same. It operates to do exactly what it was intended to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Has anybody got any other points? Uh, I've got like a half a serious one, but there might be something in that. Uh, do you ever see Chinese privilege being anything? Uh, I don't really, uh, I, I'm not very good at like uh, whatever global economics or whatever. So I just go by what people tell me, but apparently China are doing incredibly well and they might be like number one uh, global superpower. Is that something to think slash worry about or is that like guys I guess my thinking is whoever's in power is likely going to try and oppress everyone else so is that something to worry about and or is it not and yeah I guess it's so out there that I know it's a half <laughs> silly statement but yeah I'm just interested on in your thoughts. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's that silly go ahead Lisa yeah, I was just gonna say I don't even see a statement, and I think it's very it's something very very interesting actually about this time because you know China used to be considered like you know part of of the developing world. It was like the bottom of the pile, and I think you know even for example within black like radical movements, they looked at China and saw that you know they were kind of getting power, and they saw that um, if they were kind of getting power. Um, from the bottom and, and the people getting power that maybe that would translate to them and they took inspiration from China as a real you know people's movement and so now it's interesting that we do see China which was once you know part of this dark world now you know taking precedence and and, and you know taking control I don't know I really I don't know how much I can say about this I'm very interested if anybody has like any thoughts about this but the only thing that came to my mind was just um chinese neocolonialism like chinese presence in the african continent which is kind of um i don't know if it's replaced because i reckon europeans are still there like european corporations are still there but um yeah chinese corporations um like mining in the congo for example or i'm sure there are other examples um so yeah so so, so China has been growing at, at a significant pace in the world in taking the global stage in an economic perspective. So you're right in that. I mean, if you look at the investments that has been put out in, in African countries and um, in the developing countries, you can see that China is trying to, to, to play this colonial game, but in a capitalist system. Um, so it, it looks different, but it has the same undertones and the same... Um, outcomes. Um, I think the one thing, again, I will bring it back to our understanding of power and how it is um, enacted on other countries. That is where it might be different. Um, so your question to, uh, also touched on, will China then become the power that oppress everybody else? So I don't think that they, um, um, they power will be enacted on other countries, specifically as colonialism was done through violence and war and things like that. Um, but I just think that they would have the ability to cripple economies because of the control that they have in those countries. And that is how they will wield that power versus an America that um, will have the power to um, enact war on other countries and demolish that countries in that sense. So I just think it's the tactics that will change, but China definitely has taken up, um, I think it's all, almost a toss up between China and the US. Um, and we also need to be careful that sometimes we're drawn into um, political fights and wars um, with specific outcomes. So China becomes the bad guy because the US wants it to be that way. <laughs> um, and then it's all about again another cycle of um, a war that is invisible but we as people need to be woke to this because we've learned over the years how these tactics work to um, 
keep us oppressed to some extent because we're so lost in all these other spats of war and 5G and all the fights about who gets the right to be the first to develop new technology, the first to um, develop new weapons and things like that. So um, I think those are some of the things that we need to understand when we start weighing up which countries are out there to, to harm us. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for those answers. I have a, <laughs> a far follow-up question based on that and stop me if it just gets too like <laughs> hypothetical. So I guess I got a tendency to do that. But I get I guess earlier you were saying like what's the COVID what's the coronavirus for whiteness? Do you reckon in a hypothetical world where China oppressed the white world, that would start to see that would make them see what it's like living with some sort of uh, racial privilege and that could uh I guess wake them up to see, oh wow, the what I've I really didn't understand it before, but this is a, a serious thing and it needs to be stopped or <laughs> is it, am I speaking? They wouldn't directly? even understand it. They probably wouldn't yeah. even. They'd probably be like, oh, I'm so oppressed now and like totally forget about like the last 400 years, to be honest. I like the propaganda though, that uh, <laughs> the virus would come from China. I like that part. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's good. <laughs> but yeah, Basil, it would look something like that. I think it would be um, as it is now. COVID is undeniably um, disrupting people's lives all over the world. And I think if we had a COVID whiteness, it will absolutely disrupt, disrupt whiteness. I mean... Um, to the extent where while our hospitals are now filling up um, due to COVID, I think if whiteness, COVID whiteness comes out, our uh, mental institutions will fill up with white people losing their minds because the status quo has disrupted and everything that they know and have loved for 600 years has been disrupted. They couldn't live. They wouldn't be able to face the world if they wouldn't have that white privilege and that supremacy. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you for, for your answers. Thanks for the question. Any other question, comments, thoughts, arguments, debates? Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I'm just smiling because I've been enjoying this conversation the whole time. So I just thought I'd tell you thank you for the for the seminar. I've just thank been smiling you. for the first one hour. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Ah. That you enjoyed it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. If any, if nobody else has any comments, you may end it. Um, our next seminar will be in two weeks time um, we think that it's going to be on whiteness and capitalism and racism and capitalism um, yeah so if that's something you're interested in definitely come along um, yeah if nobody else has anything else to add then we can end right you so yeah. Before we go, um, I was going to send out um, that email to you guys. So Lisa, if you can drop me on Facebook on the chat, your email addresses, then I can send you the link to, to the event, which is on the 30th of July, um, which is next week, Thursday, um, where we have Robin D'Angelo and a few other of uh, my influential people in South Africa. Also, the, the, one of the panelists is the grandchild of the architect who designed apartheid in South Africa. Wow. So you'll have a good understanding after that. Wow. Yeah, you'll have a good understanding of uh, what's happening in South Africa and um, we are gonna try to align it um, with global politics of race white supremacy, COVID-19, and things like that. So everybody, 
Um, once I send out the links to Lisa and Isol, they can post it on all the other um, platforms that uh, Whiteness is on. And then everybody else, you're welcome to join us next week and enjoy the conversation. Mm, yeah, that sounds amazing. I'm definitely excited for that. I look forward to having all of you there. Cool. Okay, well, thank you for everybody for taking their time out to come and listen to us ramble on um, and yeah as we said our next seminar will be in two weeks we'll put details once we've finalised but yeah I think um, it, it's on racism and whiteness and capitalism so we hope you can come and yeah 